Get your Tarn goads ready, but keep an eye out for the Priest Kings, because you're going to gore with the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. We bring you the news and interviews from the Geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week, you notice no Mike Kafis down here anywhere, right? Mike, where the fuck are you? Anyway, so joining me this week is my buddy, Jack Ballard. Hello, how are you? Also joining me this week is uh, James Carpio, you might have seen him a couple times. Good morning. Howdy. <laughs> and our guest this week is James Grim Desborough. Uh, good morning, James. Or afternoon, afternoon, hey. GSO. <laughs> Power uh, warrior. <laughs> James is a uh, is a terrible human being and guilty of wrong think. He has worked professionally yeah. in the RPG in- industry for 15 years as a freelancer and self publisher, and is also a novelist and a short story writer. Uh, his latest game, Tales of Gore, has uh, has been a little bit of controversy, uh, it, and it is uh, controversial works of John Norman. Uh, he turned that into a tabletop RPG using the D6 system. James, welcome to the Misfits. Thank you. That's good to have you back. Now, James was on our show uh, last year sometime, uh, and uh, the Machinations of the, the uh, Space Princess was the, the show. Yep, yep. And, and you said you'd have me back soon, and it's been ages, so... Yeah. Well, hey, you, you <laughs> <Yes>. had, <laughs> hey, you had something to pimp, so here you are. <laughs> right, so work more, that's what you're telling me. <laughs> right, yeah, work harder, God damn it. No, no, actually, very excited about this Gore product. Um, uh, I got a buddy of mine, uh, one of our, our, our most time GMs, so we have two guys who GM mostly. Uh, we have a weekly gaming group that we play in, um, and he is a big fan uh, of the the gore universe and uh we have been there many times as characters in different um different games because uh, we you know we our characters would have this interdimensional traveling ability or something uh and we would wind up there and uh f- for a time it was uh, kind of a vacation planet for us for for reasons <laughs> if you've read the books you might understand why a bunch of boys would like to go vacation there <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a good time. So now that there is actually a game with good resources, you know, cause John was just, uh, he was just playing it off the, you know, off the fly from what he remembered from the books and taking notes and stuff, but he never actually sat down and like quantified all this into material. So this will be really good. And, and he's pretty excited to do it. And we're pretty excited to run in it. So, um, so let's, let's get talking about that. So uh, let's start off with, uh, with the Gore novels because we want to start with the material that this all comes from, so everybody has an understanding of what we're talking about. Mm. Um, so, so tell us, tell us about Gore, the world of Gore, and the and the and the, the books of John Norman. Okay, there's uh, 34 novels in the Gorean cycle now. Um, he fairly recently, despite I think being in his 80s, started writing again um, because the fandom kind of kept going online even when he couldn't get a publisher. But now that there's e-publishing. You know, it's it's cheaper and easier to do, and I guess it's his retirement part of his retirement plan, I suppose. Right. But yeah, but thirty-four novels is a lot to get through. Um, yeah. Trust me, I sat down and read through all of them consecutively, taking notes. So they're kind of in the tradition of the pulps, but he was writing them in the sixties, which is kind of almost post pulp. It's the the time of the sort of cheap paperback novel, but they're very much in the spirit of the pulps. So there's elements of uh, Barsoom in there. It's kind of planetary romance. There's aspects of that. There's science fantasy elements. Uh, You can see the kind of heritage of Conan and so on in it, but also shining through that, you can see Norman's clear interest in classical mythology and classical society. So there's a huge amount of influence from Greek and Roman culture and so on that comes through. And then there's the bit that everyone's interested in all the time, which is the the BDSM aspect. (laughs) So whereas Conan, you might get an idea of what he's going to get up to with the the maiden he rescues from the evil cultist or whatever in Norman, while it's not as detailed and whatever as people seem to seem to think it is it's not really erotica but it doesn't leave you any in any doubt as to what's going on and slavery is 
very much an incorporated part of the world and it's definitely politically incorrect when it comes to gender relations right right but you know from what i know of history uh slavery is is nothing new it's it's not um as a matter of fact up until recently i mean it's still going on now i mean people people are very you know people bitch about you know anyone who writes anything about slavery or talks about it or any, anything without you know damning it damning it damning it. you know i don't see them in groups or being activists uh, trying to stop, you know, the millions of people that are currently in slavery. So uh, I think it's it's a bit, you know, I was like, well, why would you focus your energy on, you know, like complaining about John Norman's books when you could be focusing your energy on all the slavery that's going on right now? On and actual millions, slavery. On right. actual yeah, slavery. No. Real slavery that's going on right now. Uh, and there's there's tons of it. But but I, I don't want to get into that too much. I mean, just the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, uh, slavery is a very much part of just about Every history, a- anywhere there was anywhere, there was slavery for the most part. Um, so, you know, yeah, and it's, it's well, kind of weird. Yeah. The one thing I kind of found interesting, too, is that uh, John Norman's books are not the only, I guess, sci-fi fantasy books that have slavery and misogyny and, and, and go on and so forth. So if you look at the works of Michael Moorcock, the Mel- the Melibonians were horrible, horrible people who I think took took their slavery and their uh, just what they did far beyond what Norman uh, talks about. I mean, they were basically semi-cannibals. They would cut people's throats to hear them scream in different pitches. However, that's socially acceptable, but the Gore books seem not to be. So and that also kind of baffles me is why, why kind of pick out one when the 60s especially had a lot of that in its... Um, and it's fantasy novelizations. I think it's because he doesn't treat it as like a, a big red flag. These are the bad guys. He kind of makes it an integral part of the society and either characters are reasonably neutral on it or come to be neutral on it or to see it as a good. And because he ties it in with gender relations, which is obviously a hot button issue and, and became one at various periods during his publication history. So... Uh, it's interesting you bring up Moorcock because Moorcock was one of his biggest critics and said oh, wow. that Gore should be consigned to the top shelf. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. That's fun. That's funny. Well, well, Jack, you're a student of history. Um, like, can you think of of any major society that existed, like advanced society, that didn't have slavery in the past? Yes. Well, I, I think that as Americans, we kind of uh, fetishize it. Uh, and and it's a very taboo topic uh, because of our own immediate uh, you know experience with it. You know, a uh, hundred two hundred years ago, there was slaves in this country, and there's not right. too many other countries in the modern world <clears throat> that can say that, except for maybe like Saudi Arabia. Um, so it's re- it, you know it's still a very hot topic to us, and everyone has to very, tread very lightly. And when you have that, you have a hypersensitivity to it, and so any kind of mention of it you know that isn't this is the, the most vile thing ever and it is you know it it's is a terrible thing nobody's yeah. saying this is great nobody's suggesting we live in a world like this but you know if you look at even you know every every text we have from ancient times gilgamesh the 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 greek writings the bible everything we have tells us about slavery there's explicit instructions in the bible on how to sell and buy slaves this is a this is a concept that people discuss every sunday um so I mean I it, it it is what it is, and definitely the past six months to to five years in this country has you know that this topic has just become untouchable and uncomfortable to talk about here. The, the, you know, yeah. let's just be honest. It's uncomfortable to bring these topics up in, in the United States. So right. I think that you know while in Europe, um, you know, you guys are always a little more open minded. We like to look at Europe as like the utopia over there, like oh they're so open minded <laughs> and, and and enlightened elves. But, uh, but, <laughs> that, but, you know, here you really got to watch what you say. And, you know, if you get the, uh, the wrong group of, of Facebook, you know, justice warriors after you, you're done. You know, so yeah. it's, it, it's, it, it, it's weird like that. So I, I can understand why some pe- people have pause and, and people have some, some sensitivity to that topic. But, you know, that's just our weird take on that. Right. Do you guys? Yeah. 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 I just real quick, I want to throw one of the things you're talking about, Gilgamesh. So uh, I'm I'm reading a book right now uh, about how the, the human condition, how humans evolved, uh, and they were talking about two two important documents 
uh, that he just he just laid out as part of the discussion. I won't go into that because it's too much. But uh, the Code of Hammurabi was one of them talking about this is the first sort of like basically the first time that that laws are set down to to regard fairness. And uh, but if you if you read the code, uh, society is grouped into three goes the, the the upper class. There is the standard class, and then there are slaves. And it's no, I mean, it's it's there's no euphemism for it. That's exactly what they are. And so the rights are dis- distributed in that way, so that if you yeah. hurt like an upper class person, the punishment is is vicious. If you hurt like a commoner, it's it's kind of normal. But if you hurt a slave, it's money. You just have to pay the person. You know, like, like if you, if, if you break a man's arm, your arm, uh, your arm can be broken in, 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 as a retribution. However, if you break a man's slave's arm, uh, you just have to pay him five shekels. So it's just, it's like, it, you know, it's just, it's just a part of history. That's all. I just want to establish that this is nothing Mm -hmm. new. And if you're writing a book about past societies and you don't have it in it, you're actually not being accurate. Yeah. 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 And there seems to be this weird idea creeping in lately that all fantasies have to be utopian that when you're creating a fantasy world for some reason you have to correct every wrong that's ever existed (laughs) Um, which doesn't leave you much much room for story in in my opinion i mean and with gore i think a large part of the slavery is the world building because the, the world and to an extent the solar system is sort of watched over and protected by these mysterious aliens called called the priest kings um and that on gore they maintain these kind of technology taboos so certain technologies are allowed and are much more advanced than on earth like medical technology and so on but other technologies aren't so a lot on gore still comes down to muscle power you know wars are still fought by men with shields and spears and and right. swords and you know riding animals and and so on and labor is still done by hand all, all that kind of stuff which was why to a large extent, a lot of these older societies had slaves so that they could, you know, do things on a big scale, on an industrial scale, without having industrialization. So there's an aspect of that that's part of it. The contra- more controversial side to it, I think, and this is, I, th- I think Norman's a philosophy professor, uh, come to think of it. I think some of this comes down to that. He's kind of contrasting gore, which is meant to be kind of a, a world in a state of nature, almost a zoo kept by the priest kings who are trying to maintain man in this kind of natural state versus earth which is seen by the Koreans as being perverse and constructed and wrong so there's there's almost a, a nature nurture argument going on in how he contrasts the world yeah people kind of dismiss it as you know cheap swords and sandals and a, and a, you know tits and ass but there's some underlying philosophical ideas under it all that whether you agree with them or not or what I think makes it something something bigger and more interesting, and that's why it's held people's attention through all these years. Right. So, so James, you're reading. You're you, you've picked it up. I read the first book. I read uh, Tarz Menegor because you know the game's coming out. My friend's been talking about this this book series forever. Uh, <laughs> I I read it. Um, or, or read the first book. Right. I only read one of them so far. Uh, but you're you're into your third book. So what do you, what do you think? Yeah. is a new Gore, and you've never even heard of it before. No. So, so tell us what your thoughts are on this on this new this new thing that you've discovered. Um, actually, I I really really like it. I plan to listen to it until my eyes roll out of my head. And the reason I, I say that is because there's certain parts of the books so far that I really really engaging, and then there's some parts where I just kind of roll my eyes and go, "Oh my god, all right, whatever." Um, <laughs> And so, and there's a point though, is, um, so let's take the protagonists of the first two books, the female protagonists. So Talana, to me, she really wasn't a subject of misogyny only for the fact that shit, she's tried to kill um, Cabot on a couple, like twice within, I think the first like couple of chapters in the beginning of the book, she throws him off of a tarn. And then in the second thing, she sets him up to be captured by, um, by enemies and realistically she did kind of submit but not particularly and eventually she became his free companion which on gore is the equivalent to a a wife yeah um in book two you meet lara um the tatrix of tharna if i remember correctly and um 
that's where I kind of started to get a little eye rolly because in the beginning she came off as this really, really strong character. I she almost was kind of akin to an Amazon, where men in Tharna were kind of considered beasts, and sh she would have these things called amusements where she would like torture men in this huge public event. So I was really getting excited at this character because I'm going, wow, there's finally this really, really, really strong female character in the books. And as we get further into the books, she then starts kind of getting wishy-washy and and kind of like, oh, you know, you're right. You're, you're this awesome male figure. And I kind of had, I don't want to say a problem with it, but it really kind of was disheartening because I like the fact that Norman puts these really strong female characters in the book. However, it kind of gets weird because it seems like as you have these strong characters, before you go up, goes on, they start becoming less and less powerful and more and more submissive. So, uh, but, oh, but besides yeah. that, honestly, the visions, I mean, uh, visually in my head that I can imagine what a tarn would look like. And it's a, it's a big see, bird that people ride for anyone who's not yeah. familiar. But yeah. I can, you know, visually I can like close my eyes and see gore. And it's just this awesome, very uh, intense, uh, sword and sorcery setting and he has a lot of nuances in it so if i really just kind of take out the parts where i roll my eyes and go okay really <laughs> um I, i'm it's, it's an awesome series okay you will be rolling your eyes quite a lot more through the series because it's a common theme of having the sort of haughty woman brought low and turned around but there are female characters that stay you know stay strong there are there are occasions of that i mean talina her story throughout the books sort of goes goes up and down uh -huh. so you know she she falls low regains power you know does horrible things falls low again you know things like that there's um in the panther girls it's like the there's a, there's a completely untamable woman who who leads yeah. the panthers in the northern forest you know there, there's there's things like that all, all throughout the books and lots of conspirators and so on so I do have a question, though, because I haven't gotten there yet. But from what I understand, Book 19, Kajira of Gore, it, I've heard it described as the manuscript for the Gorian lifestyle, the, the whole BDSM culture. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, which particular aspect? The book, the BDSM <laughs> culture, the, the Gorean <laughs> subset of the BDSM <laughs> Um, well, a lot of so a couple of people I've spoken to had said that that book was basically like the textbook for living the submissive or dominant Gorian lifestyle. So I, I'm just I guess asking, does it come across more as like a a player's handbook of BDSM, or <laughs> is it just the well, overtones? Norman did write a book separately, a nonfiction book called Imaginative Sex, which was basically about role playing BDSM scenarios. But this was the uh, way back before everyone and his monkey knew knew about BDSM. I mean, I'm a I'm a kinkster, so I try not to judge people, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't judge Koreans if as long as they're having fun. Yeah, yeah, I don't care. You know, what, what, whatever floats your boat. Uh, regarding the book, I suppose that's the one that goes into the the kind of fine detail of Korean slavery the most. I mean, most of the ones that are done from a female point of view do that. To an, to an extent, but that's probably yeah, that's probably that's probably the one. But you know, the the game isn't really about that. But I do hope some of the kinky green people get their get their kicks out of reading the books too. <laughs> so. And I, I think that's a big thing. You know, this is and you've said this on your on your Facebook page. I've read this a lot, and uh, and some of the other places that you've talked about this is that you know this is fantasy. That's that's what this is. This is not you're not advocating anything for anyone. You're just putting out a product based upon a series that you liked that no one else is going to touch. If you didn't do it, I can't imagine anyone else in this industry that was going to do it. So good. I mean, that, that's a good thing because, you know, we should have variety for people who want things different yeah. than what the main public wants. Uh, but, you know, it all boils down to all of this is fantasy. And, you know, and, and you know, there's no reason there's you're, you really should never um, – criticize anyone for their own personal fantasies as long as they don't hurt anybody long nobody ever gets hurt it's all good you know uh, you do, I, I think yeah. it's really upsetting that we live in a world where we have to sit here and apologize for 10 minutes on creation 
any, yeah. any kind of work of fiction, game, whatever. Like we have to sit here and be like, well, it's not that bad, and it's not this, and it's not going to do this, and nobody's going to get hurt. Like it's so sad, you know. It's almost easier, like when in the 1920s, when everything was in the closet and underground, and people could just do whatever the fuck they want, and nobody would ever know. You know, the the principal of the high school liked to get you know sodomized with the strap on. Nobody batted an eye because nobody knew. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. But now it's like we, our lives are so public now. We have to almost apologize for things that we like or things that we want to do. And it's so bizarre to me. I, 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 I think it's so weird. I think, uh, you know, cultural anthropologists are going to look back at this and be like, what, what was so, you know, all these hangups, everything, yeah. Yeah, everything demands <laughs> apology. I'm sorry. Right. I like to wear a dress. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to go do this. Like fuck. Anyway, yeah, I, I just let's start with odd. Yeah, but Jack, now it's not. I'm sorry. I want to wear a dress. Now it's. I'm sorry. I laughed at the guy who wanted to wear a dress. Right. I'm, right. I'm right. sorry yeah. that I found that funny. Am I picking on yeah. him? No. I yeah. personally thought it was funny, but now I'm the fucking bad guy. Right. Yeah, you're I mean, horrible. Yeah. You're right. Horrible. Well, you know, for example, like um, a few weeks back, I made a Facebook post about how I'm reading the Gore series. It was just meant to go, hey, there's this cool series, I'm reading it. And it just turned into a shit show. And it's just like, <laughs> why can't I just go, hey, I I really like this series. I want to read more. I'm enjoying it. No, I can't enjoy it because apparently you know, 12 other people out there think that I shouldn't because I'm a horrible, horrible person. And it's like, well, you are, James. You're yeah. Fucking terrible. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's the, it's the name James that does it. It just turns you evil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after, uh, I was so anyway, after book two, I ran out and bought my red carpet and slave collar, man. I'm all ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So anyway. All right. So look, let's uh, let's let's continue on. <laughs> so there is influences for Edgar Rice Burroughs that I, that I have noticed. Um, I, I like Edgar Rice Burroughs work better. I mean, that's just me. Um but like, how do you, how do you, like, where do you feel that? I mean, I know it's there. Like, I can't pick it out exactly where it is. Uh, but I mean, I just, I can just, is it just in the style you think? Or is there, can you guys pick out anything that's like particular that, that, because uh, I mean, it just has it all over it. Well, apocryphally, the story is that he read some Burroughs and some other pulps and thought, oh, this is easy. Anyone can do this and started writing books. So apocryphally, that's that's the story of how he got started. I don't know whether it's true or not. I, I probably think it isn't, but I do think he was influenced. So I guess in the early books, it does much more follow that kind of pulp planetary planetary romance kind of mold, and that it's a man caught between two worlds, and he travels back and forth, and you know the the letters are passed on to uh, Harrison Smith, his, right. his lawyer. So it's presented as if this is a real story about a real world that's been sent back to our world and then published as books, which, you know, was a really common device. I mean, Verne used it, Wells used it, and right right the way through to the pulp era. And, I mean, yeah, you, you saw that in, in Burroughs' work as well. So there's that aspect. Um, the difference in gravity, there's, you know, Gore is supposedly slightly less less gravity than Earth, which was a you know a big thing with regard to Barsoom. The Fantastical Beasts, um, you know, different structure. Talina is basically a, a, a princess in the way that you know Deja Torres is, things like that. But that kind of influence gradually wears away after the first few books. You know, Tal very much becomes. A man of gore and it's you know the stories are much more focused there um and you don't really get so much mention of earth there's, there's not really the traveling back and forth in the same way though it it is there it's it's just in the background so it becomes its own thing by the third or fourth book i think i think okay so you think maybe he's because i know that i know gore was his first yeah, that's the first books he wrote right and times when gore is the first book he wrote and yeah. um or at least that's how i understand it. yeah okay um, i think i think that's right this tell nari did as well and some time traveling books as well okay so. um but i think he was that's probably where he started finding finding his own voice you know like as a writer like he you know he's he's got to step on the he, you know he's stepping off the shoulders of the greats and finding you know becoming his his own great uh i find that so like for example um you know reading tolkien right so tolkien wrote the Hobbit and, and Lord of the Rings and some similar, some of the stuff that went into the similarian. Right. Um, yeah. But that was it. Right. That's all. I mean, I think it's all, I think it's all he wrote really. 
Uh, but um, I know The Hobbit was his first book. And when I was reading The Hobbit, I could actually feel his writing getting better as he was writing it. So, like, the first several chapters, first, like, six chapters of The Hobbit aren't actually that good from a writer. Like, from a from a skilled writer standpoint, I found myself kind of like, oh, he's, I thought I remembered him being a better writer than this. And then as you get to The Hobbit, like, oh, it's picking up. Okay, that's right. This is the first book he ever wrote. He was getting better as he wrote. And he never went back and, and wrote it. I think with The Hobbit, it also starts out much more like a children's book and then becomes a more grown-up book as you go through it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like that probably happens with a lot of writers. You know, their first books, obviously, are not nearly as good as their later books. And, um, yeah. you know, they improve. So I'm hoping, because I, I, I got through the first one, I was kind of like, ooh, I don't know. He's not the greatest writer in the world, but I like the, I like the world. I do like the world. I like yeah. the setting, and I like, I like the, 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 the basic story. Um, I'm having a hard time with his actual writing style a little bit, but uh, James, you were saying it's starting to get better. Like, um, it's well, it's yeah. I mean, it's starting to become more fleshed out. Okay. I mean, his writing is still kind of in this like meh for me, but I think he's become the his vision of gore. You can definitely tell is getting stronger. He's starting to feel it out more, almost in a sense, kind of living in the world more. Okay. And okay. being able to explain the surroundings where the first book was kind of like very conceptual. Uh, second book, it's a little deeper. And then obviously now that I finally figure, I'm not going to give spoilers, but now that I know exactly what the priest Kings are, I was just kind of like, that's kind of cool. Okay. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It kind of it ebbs and flows through the series. I mean, you've got, you know, 30 plus books. It, it's right. going to do that. There's, there's peaks and troughs in some of them. He gets more lecturing and it's more, kind of him projecting his ideas through the book and the, and through the characters and there's less on the less adventure and less exploration and so on and then others it swings back the other way um yeah so it, it's it's very mixed the kind of the kind of balance of the aspects that he puts into the books changes quite a lot through through the series so for me i th i think the sort of peak is around players of gore i can't remember quite which number book that is but that's that's probably my favorite of the series. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause I, like, like with Burroughs books, uh, my buddy Chessman Agora is his favorite. That's the one he really likes. You know, he, he thinks hmm. that um, Chessman, or I'm sorry, Chess, did I say Chessman Agora? Chessman and Mars. Sorry. The Chessman yeah. and Mars is, is his favorite of, of that series. And he said, that's where Burroughs is really like nailing it um, with that series. All right. So, so let's talk about the RPG. So you, you, you read these books, you love the material, you know, we've given a good background for the world. Um, and so you made a role playing game out of it. Um, so how similar or different is it from, from the novelization? Did you try and stick as tight as you could to the, uh, the novelizations? Uh, as much as possible. I mean, I, I think when you're, for me at least, when you're producing a game based on someone else's material, it's really important to be respectful of that material and to present it as close to as is as possible. I'm not someone who would want to go and revise and change things. Um, some people have done that with, with things like uh, Conan licenses. You know, they've changed things, altered things. It's not the way I'd go about it. Sometimes you have to because there's holes in the world so going back to Conan again, certain things are only mentioned very briefly or sketchily, and so you have to fill stuff in. Um, but another aspect of this is that Gore has such a, an active and obsessive fan base right. that you're kind, of, you're kind of stepping into a minefield with whatever approach you take. I've had bad experiences working with properties that had really engaged fan bases before. Like I was very briefly a uh, line developer for SLA Industries, meant meant to be looking after it, and and you know while it was kind of between properties, but the community behind SLA Industries, because there had been so few game releases and so on for it, they'd filled in a lot of the world for themselves and had very definite ideas about how they interpreted things. So that when you came back to try and develop that material, you ran into fans who already had their own highly developed headcanon and they didn't like it when you contradicted it. So with my approach with Gore then was to try and take the core material from the books, which wasn't that easy because there's some differences between reprints of the books and there's some contradictions here and there between what it says in one part of one book and what it says in another. So I had to make occasional decisions to reconcile 
which interpretation to take of say the warrior codes or whether women could be part of a particular cast or not and things like that. So I had to come down and make a decision on, on some things there. But then when I wanted to, cre to create room for players to put their own spin, I've tried to put it in terms of suggestions. So, you know, if you don't like this part of the game, you could always spin it this way and do it different. Or this part of the world isn't detailed particularly in the books, but here's what I think it might be. Maybe you want to go with that. So right. I've tried to center it around canon and then make suggestions uh, and op create options around the rest. Right, right. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you always get these arguments with people who who complain about original works that are developed for other media. So, uh, for example, Walking Dead goes from a comic book to a TV show, and you got these people like, oh, that's going off the comic. It's like, but what people, like, have a hard time with is, is that mediums don't, they, it's not a one-to-one -one crossover from one medium to another. There's there's these, these factors that once you get into it and you start thinking about it, you start, like, you know, running the paces with it. You're like, well, we didn't do this, and this is why we couldn't do this because this medium is different than that medium. You know, a comic, like say for example, a comic book has, you know, it's it's images and words, right? Well, that doesn't translate to a TV show because that's video that's running all the time, and it's you know you have a an hour time slot to fill, and you've got to work in commercials, and the season is limited by this, and the network needs that, and commercials need this, you know, and there's all these things. Um, that, that when you transition over, it's like, well, these things had to change, and then they had repercussions down the line. And then there's also the fact that, well, people have already read all this stuff. Do they just want to see a direct translation of that? Won't that be kind of boring? Um, so yeah. it's just everything has immediate – so I can only imagine uh, how much change has to occur between a novelization and a role-playing game because, you know, back in the 60s, you know, he's just writing books. He's not thinking about, you know, translating into anything else, I'm sure – at that point. So who knows how detailed of a library, you know, world library he kept at his desk where he could go through and go, what did I say about this planet? Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so then when you go in and you start doing your thing, like, well, he didn't flesh out this entire region. He just flies over, but my characters can't do that because my characters, the players are going to go, well, that wasn't the novel too much. So I've always wanted to check that world out and see what's down there. And you're like, well, I, you, you know what I know. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but, Going from book to film, I mean, those are both static, passive media that you sit and you consume that you don't interact with. Games, it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah. Uh, computer games are somewhat constricted by technology, so you know you can direct people and they kind of expect it a bit. But in tabletop games, people expect to be able to do just about anything or to at least have the illusion of doing just about anything. So you're not telling a story. You're not adapting a story. You're just kind of presenting a world in which other people will create and have their adventures so yeah that that's that's the stance you kind of have to take with it right yeah. so so uh you did it in the d6 system and i know james you had a you had a little bit of like what the hell uh, <laughs> so so tell us give us the reasoning behind and d6 i mean it's it's open source i know that's probably one of the one of the main factors right yeah one one of the reasons um I didn't feel they particularly needed a bespoke system. Um, There's a couple of other reasons. The, the main one being that D6 is what used to power the, the West End Games version of Star Wars, mm -hmm. which, is, which is science fantasy, which is essentially what, what gore is. So, you know, it's fairly suited to that kind of high adventure thing. Though I had to up the deadliness a little bit. Um, and D6 uses character templates, so you can just say, oh, well, you know, in the case of Star Wars, okay, I'm going to be a moisture farmer who becomes an adventurer. So I'll grab the moisture farmer template and I'll just add a few points here and there. Okay, and I'm good to play. And on Gore, it's got a very strict cast system across most of the world. So if you're a warrior, you can take the warrior template, customize it, and you'll be ready to play in an instant. Uh, another big factor for me was that for a lot of people, that West End game, Star Wars game, was like their, their first RPG. That was their introduction to it. And the D6 system is very suitable as, a, as an introductory RPG. And the Gore community obviously has a lot of fans who may or may not have necessarily role-played. There's big role-playing communities for it online, but they're more used to freeform role-playing. So if I wanted to kind of ease them into gaming, if I wanted to make it as accessible as possible to as wide a fan base with as varying a degree of you know, experience with role playing as possible. I really wanted to go for a, a system that was, you know, easy, had a proven track record as being, 
you know, a good new system for people to take up. And, you know, six-sided dice are the easiest ones to get hold of as well. That, right. Yeah, that, that doesn't hurt. So it's a combination, a combination of reasons. You know, open, relatively easy to pick up, good beginner system, suits the genre. Yeah, it just kind of came together. Okay. And and I'm sure it's probably, I would imagine, I bought it. I haven't really had it. I've been very, very busy. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really dig into it from a from a game design perspective. I mean, I kind of, kind of flipped through the pages. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm doing it with my hands, even though it was on my computer. Uh, <laughs> James, you have the books. If you have the books handy, can you um, – can you you just got them, right? The hard yeah. book? If you can grab those real quick just so we can show it off. All right. Let me okay. go and uh, grab it. I'll be right back. Right. So, so I have, like I said, I haven't really dug into the system from a game mechanic standpoint. Um, but I remember really liking the Star Wars, the original Star Wars game, a lot. I mean, we had a lot of fun with that. I haven't played it in forever. Um, uh, but, um, but I do remember really liking it and thinking that of all the star versions of star Wars I've played, that that was actually my favorite uh, of them. Yeah. Um, cause I think we played, I forget what it was. I think it was the force unleashed version for D 20 or something like that. I don't, I can't remember, but I just remember like, well, it basically boiled down to, if you're not a Jedi, you might as well not even be playing. I mean, that's, it just really turned into that. <laughs> it's like from a game standpoint, it's like, well, I'm a smuggler. It's like, well, I'm going to just sit back and watch you guys, you you other Jedi, just do everything. And then when you're all done, I'll just share in the treasure. So uh, have fun, you know, because whatever <laughs> I do is fucking pointless. Uh, but I, in the D6 system, it wasn't like that. I remember it not being like that. I remember it being everybody, um, everybody contributed and was able to contribute. And no one overpowered or overtook anything. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm playing in a D6 Star Wars game at the moment. Um, I've joined it late. The people who had been playing it have been playing it for years and years and years. But yeah, the Jedi having to get all their Force skills and stuff separately kind of sucked up their experience points and gave other people space to be good at stuff that was useful. So. Right. Oh. It's like it's like okay, Jedi, my our spaceship broke down. What are we gonna do? It's like oh, I can't fix anything. All my points went into uh, f you know lightsaber it's like well you can't lightsaber the ship back together now can you you know so <laughs> it's like so like, you need me now <laughs> so, but in, but in like the d20 you know it wasn't like that because you know it's because it's D D. you know everybody can be kind of good at everything really it just depends on what level yeah. you are uh so it'd be like well i don't need you because i can do that too it's like oh okay well i guess i have no point yeah it's kind of like the system does the system does break at you right. when you get really good at stuff but um in gore that's less of a problem i think yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't not too many Jedi and Gore, I would imagine. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so James, you got you got the books, huh? So, um, I guess I'll I'll put them up one by one. So yes, the the actual role playing uh, game version of it. Let me just right there. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Which I believe that's a Kerr on the front. James? Yep, that's a Kerr. Yeah, they're the enemy alien species that's trying to take over the solar system. Okay. But yeah, no, it's, uh, as I'm holding it up, it's actually a very uh, thick book. The black and white artwork is brilliant. So it really fits the uh, the mood of the game. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and I was looking at the, uh, the templates, which is really nice. So if you just completely want to play the game, you just grab a template, as James said, modify it and run with it. The one that I really like, and I actually got in hardcover, is the encyclopedia, which is just everything that's, you know, pretty much what it is. An encyclopedia, you look up anything like uh, like Lure Girls or The Machine of Truth. It's, it's all in there and all written out. So hey, I, haven't example, actually, I haven't actually seen the hard copy yet. I haven't got my proof copy. Did it print okay <laughs> oh, on the wow. inside? <laughs> but it, no, it came out incredibly nice and uh, oh, very clean. Yeah. Cool. But the thing I like about this book is that if I didn't want to use a D6 system, I could literally run gore from this book. You know, it wouldn't have all this super deep details about like the character types, but this is really awesome. Just as even if you're not a gamer and want to have uh, something like a gore encyclopedia, this is totally worth it. I mean, like I said, I got in hardcover just because it's an awesome book. And then while the one is on order now, which is the one that's based on book two, I did also pick up the uh, the module, which I haven't actually read yet, but the artwork was just so compelling that I was like, all right, fine, I will buy it. 
think like this one particular, I'm assuming is a slave, has yeah. sunglasses on, which was kind yeah. of, but I mean, do they wear sunglasses later on in the series? Uh, no, but it'll make sense when you read the, okay. when you read the adventure. So, um, but actually, if I can just kind of tangent a little bit, I just watched Outlaw. Um, on uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, which is the second of the gore movies. Talk about um, taking liberties with the story. <laughs> like, they had characters all mixed up. They weren't even portraying the characters as they were in the book. And I, and according to the movie, gore was took place in, like, 1984 with feathered <laughs> hair. And uh... Oh, I remember it very clearly. Yes. Wood paneled station wagons, yeah, the whole nine yards. Well, there's or... a scene where they enter Coroba and you look in the background and it's a modern farm village. It's like really <laughs> Yeah, Coroba's supposed to be like the, the, the cylinders, right? The like big yeah. tall right. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I, I so... never saw them I never saw the movies. I, I I think I caught part of one on like one Saturday when I was flipping through the channels. And I, the only reason I even remember that that, that was a, uh, a gore thing was because, you know, I did the info thing and looked at it. I was like, oh, this is that, that thing that John was talking about. And I got about 10 minutes into it. And I'm like, I can't watch this. And I just kept going. I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> I was like, what, what is yeah, this? They're pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm pretty critical about, you know, I, I'm not a B movie. I like some B movies, but because uh, like, like Flash Gordon is like one of my favorite movies ever. But um, I have a hard time with a lot of B movies. I can't, I'm just like I, I don't have time for this. Like, I need to do something else. <laughs> I could be I could be creating a, a, a I don't know something anything. <laughs> uh, so um, so you you were we were talking before the show we a little bit of pre show stuff we were talking about and um, I asked you about flack on this you know because because you know it's controversial and everything. So uh, you said you haven't gotten really as much flack as you thought you might, but apparently the, when you were doing the Kickstarter. Um, a lot of people came at you during that time yeah i mean you've got to put it in context i suppose um i mean i started the kickstarter in 2014 and you know we only just came out with the book which is way over schedule um it's not really anyone's fault the the artist michael manning who did such such great work he had a really shitty couple of years i can't really go into any detail on it but you know he that's what caused the delays um yeah i just had to kind of hang on and and let him take his time and there was nothing i could do <laughs> you know, yeah it was already written and i already had the layout waiting for the art to be dropped in you know it it, it could have been out a year and a half ago at least if if it hadn't been for these problems but yeah there you go but so that means when i was doing the kickstarter it was during kind of the, the height of gamergate and all of that stuff going on so things were much more feverish um much more intense at that time so kind of doing the kickstarter at that time meant i got a lot of support um but also meant i got a, a huge amount of flack you know there's uh, God knows how many pages thread on RPG net of people calling it evil and saying all kinds of horrible, untrue things about me. You know, the social media posts galore. It's, it's all over the place. You know, just, just people saying the most horrendous, terrible things. Um, but then when I actually came out with it now, not quite so much. Um, I mean, there's, there's some people being horrible. I suspect there's a lot more going on I can't see because people blocked me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that's probably part of it. Right. Um, but what I have noticed is that when I'm arguing about something else, as I want to do, I will now be dismissed as, oh, you're that guy who wrote you're that guy. Right. Blocked. Right. <laughs> so, right. Right. Yeah, I know. So, I, you know, talking about RPG Net, you know, our, our buddy... Uh, we have a buddy who, and I'm not going to say his name because he does not like to be mentioned uh, on things that he's not part of. But we have a buddy that goes on RPG, RPG Net all the time, and he gets in these arguments with people. And I'm just like, why are you even on there? I hate <laughs> RPG Net. Okay, I won't do it. I think it's just it's a bunch. Uh, um, I'm sure there's some great people on there, but the only problem is is they're always drowned out. By the 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 man children or, or women children or whatever it, whatever you want to take 
whatever, or, or trans children. I, fuck, I don't even know anymore. But anyway, it's got all these, like, I mean, like, literally horrible people on there who just nothing but, but just bash people and gang up and attack relentlessly over whatever hot button issue that, you know, that they want to go against whatever. So you got to be careful. You got tiptoe and I don't tiptoe. I just say what I, I, I say what I feel. Um, if I, if I feel like I don't want to catch flack for it, I just don't say anything, but I'm not going to like not say stuff. So I can't even be on there because I know it would just be one fight after another. Cause I just don't put up with people's shit. Um, but he gives on there and he just fights with people. I was like, why do people even go on there? I, I don't understand it. I, I, I have no how, clue. How is he, he not banned? He's, uh, I don't know. Uh, James, has he ever been banned? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, actually, as soon as you start talking about it, it's exactly who you're talking about. Um, I think he actually has had like a couple of weeks here and there uh, okay. on his rant. But um, I don't think he's ever been perma banned. Okay. Karma band. Yeah. Yeah, Jack, they do this thing. I, I know you're not you're not really active in this kind of stuff, but on on a lot of these groups that have uh that are very socially conscious or whatever, you can yeah. apparently be perma banned from things because you don't agree with the group think. Uh oh, it's, it's this whole group think thing. So oh, sure. hey, if you, if I originally got permanently banned for not liking the new world of darkness. That was why I was originally banned. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when when people are talking about being enlightened, it's like, well, you're a knuckle dragger. It's like, well, yeah, but you see, you permanently ban people for having different ideas than you. And if you ask me, that's primitive. That is about as primitive as it gets. That's in grouping and out grouping. That's very reptilian. It's like, you are the fucking knuckle draggers. Um, if, if you were going to, if you were actually going to be enlightened, you would be fine with people having their own thoughts. You may disagree with them. That's fine. Perfect. Great. No problem. But when you, when you have to shut down alternate ideas, you're the fucking primitive. Well, this is a true story. Oh, go ahead. Some people are genuinely assholes, but just disagreeing with someone doesn't make you an asshole. (laughs) Well, no, right. Exactly. No, you're entitled to disagree. People can disagree. True story. What were you saying? I got a, a friend of mine who just recently decided that he doesn't think the world is round. He thinks it's flat. He just oh. recently decided that he has looked into the matter. He's done exhaustive research, and he's just decided that the world is flat because it fits his biblical worldview, and it, and it fits his, his where he is in his life at this point. So uh, I see on Facebook groups he belongs to, and one of them is the Flat Earth Free Thinkers Society, which I just think is hilarious. <laughs> You know, so I, I went on to the page, and there's this big red type, and it says, "If you put up pro sphere arguments, you will be banned." And so it's like, here we are, and if you put up anything that says contrary to what we believe, you're banned immediately. Like, and I was just like, I couldn't believe it. And all these articles that are like pseudoscience, like, oh well, obviously the Earth is flat. I mean, you know, if you look at the degrees of the sun and it, well, the way it hits this thermometer and like, and it's like, and it's like, you read it and you're like, it doesn't make any sense. And there's 900 likes and, oh yeah, I agree. I, I had my kids read this. I'm like, holy shit. But yeah, on any kind of any, any spherical argument. So you can't even say, I guess the pizza exists or anything <laughs> because the, you know what I mean? And that's how people live. They just put those blinders on and that's it. And I, I'm very much into music, and so I know, like, like Mastodon, this band I like, just put out an album, and there's so many people that are like, this is the worst thing that ever happened. I'm throwing all my records away, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> what? They put out an album you didn't like, so this album that you love is no longer valid? Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, so people are just weird about shit that they love. They really are. They're really weird about stuff like that. Well, also, too, I think this sort of thing brings attention, and even though, I mean... There's no such thing as bad bad pub ah, bad publicity. I'll learn English someday. Um, so, for example, James came into my, I guess, vision as a as an industry person because I used to, I, I mean I used to read uh, SLA industry stuff, but it was RPG.net and they were arguing over this series here, which was the Slayer's Guides. <laughs> And that's actually the first time I really uh, started hearing about James because, like, a lot of the Slayer's Guides material, I guess, were offensive and people were being touchy about them, which is really weird because I found nothing touchy or offensive about them. Um, but, you know, so it's 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 kind of odd, the stuff that 
people will lip out under, even if it's meant to be parody and make parody these days without people being sensitive and <laughs> going to run in their corners crying about it. You know, yeah. you know what's interesting. So James, one of the guys was was criticizing you, and and I I like to go look at people's pages. I'm, I'm when somebody's on Facebook and they start saying some dumb shit or something I don't agree with, something I don't like. I just like to go check their page out to get perspective because it gives me some a page is very telling. <clears throat> Your Facebook page is very telling as to who you are. So I go on their page and I'm looking around. I find out, oh they work for this this other company. Let's see what that other company. Let's see what they did there. Their big product was some kind of sex guide to role playing or something and right on the cover is a guy a male character tied up by a female character uh as a captive and i was like this guy is criticizing you he's criticizing you for writing a game about females being enslaved that's what he was talking about and right on the cover of the book that he put out is a guy tied up by a woman and i'm and it's a sexual book it's about sex so I'm like, yeah, that seems a little hypocrite. If you had put that book out and had the woman tied up, you'd have been fucking mud. And that was very well, interesting to me. Well, can I can I speak to that? Sure. Um, OK, to be absolutely crystal clear, while I've got the option here. OK, I, I am kinky. I'm into the <laughs> BDSM scene. OK, sure. but con- consent is absolutely fundamental to the kink scene. Sure. It, yeah, everything everything is negotiated. You got safe words. So if you don't like something that's happening, you know, you say, I don't know, yellow badger or whatever, and grape fruit is mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every everything stops. That that's it. It's over. Right in Gore, I am presenting a fantasy world based on a set of fantasy novels, it, which is based around some ideas that okay aren't true. Um, about fundamental female submission and fundamental male dominance and a world in which this is considered to be true, just as in other fantasy worlds, magic is considered to be true or whatever. And they have elves. Now, what, <laughs> yeah. now, what really gets me about this situation is that a lot of the time, the same people who are screaming to the rafters about this are the same people who are screaming quite rightly that we should be accepting of people in all kinds of other ways, you know? So we quite rightly should be accepting of trans people. We quite rightly should be accepting of homosexual people. We quite rightly should be accepting of people's various sexual proclivities or whatever. But the one way in which they seem to have no tolerance is male sexual domination, whether it's in a BDSM context or or not. It doesn't seem to matter whether there's, there's consent None of it seems to matter to them. They seem to regard this as being somehow some some evil reinforcement of patriarchal norms or or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't seem to matter that everybody is having a good time and everyone's consenting. Right. It's just somehow this this thing that you're doing privately in your bedroom, there's the irony, it, right. it is wrong and bad and evil. So there's a fundamental hypocrisy there. But it, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me at all that someone like like you say, who's being deeply critical of me putting this out would have something that's essentially the mirror universe double of it on their own page and in their own product. They don't see the hypocrisy. And I would be completely accepting of, of, of their product and their point of view, sure. but they won't, they won't be to me. And I, I don't know. It just drives me crazy. <laughs> right, right. I just, I just thought that was really ironic. I mean, I had no problem with the book. I, again, like, I don't care that, that they, that a woman had a guy tied up. That's cool. Whatever. I, I might like yeah. that, but whatever you're into. But, Whatever you're into, yeah. right? But uh, I just thought I, it just it just struck me because that's the first thing I found out about this guy. I'm like, you were just saying, oh, forget it. You know, I'm just like, you, I, can't. I, I, I can't. I just can't. The world is not flat, asshole. You know, I mean, it's the same kind of mentality. You know, it just drives me nuts. It uh, might I'm be like, you just bought into the uh, the globe conspiracy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm, I, you fucking shill. You're I'm right. not even paying you. Big globe, right? Miriam Webster <laughs> got you all wrapped around your finger and your globe factories all over the world putting out lies. <laughs> and I, I've, I've written horror games. That doesn't mean I'm endorsing Jason going around stabbing people with a machete, does it? Right, so exactly. why is it when why is it when I write this game somehow I have to be endorsing? I don't know. Right. Uh, anyway, all right, we're beating it to death. All right. So anyway, um. 
So I have a question about about it being you. So you have it up online. I think you have it on RPG Net. Is RPG Now? Fuck, I always get this. RPG mixed up. Now. Yeah. RPG Now. Is there any chance that they could that that it could get pulled from there? Because I know some games have. Are you are you good? Are they going to keep it? I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but I should be good. There okay. shouldn't be a problem. That's I fine. think. Possibly it could still get reported and then it would go into a process of review. Uh, so it might get pulled for a couple of days, but there shouldn't be any issue. All right, good, I have good. taken precautions, so, so to speak. So if somebody goes there and, for example, it's pulled and you got like, God damn it, I wanted to buy this. Could they come back to your site? Would there be an alternate way to get it? I don't have my own store. It's just it's, it's not really I don't have enough traffic and, and so on to make it worth worth the cost yet at this point so you'd have to wait if it, it did get pulled permanently for whatever reason i would seek to find some other outlet i've got fairly good relations now with with norman's agent and the current holders of the book license so we might be able to work something out okay. otherwise people should still be able to get the the print on demand so they should still be able to get the hard copy if the if there is any issue but i don't anticipate there being any issue okay good good fantastic uh all right well i guess uh, that's that's really all i have i mean we talked <clears throat> i was going to ask about gamergate uh oh yeah let, let's do that because you, you have a book coming out for that or you're trying to work on a book for that so we'll talk about that real quick um inside gamergate uh is, is a product that you're you're trying to create um and you have a patreon going on for that so real quick let's go through that just just briefly what okay what the hell is gamergate anyway i mean i've never been able to nail that down okay depending who you ask it's either a massive online harassment campaign against women and minorities in computer games and mm -hmm. ancillary nerd stuff, or it was a massive consumer revolt against corruption in games media and censorship of online discussion. Mm. I tend to fall in the, in the latter camp. Um, I was involved since before it was Gamergate because, um, you know, censorship and corruption stuff, these are kind of hot button issues for me. So, you know, I was, I was going to be interested. I was involved from the start right through until it petered out really last last year, and I've been watching the aftermath ever since. So uh, I felt it was important to have that perspective from someone within it who right. took part in it alongside the other perspectives that are, that are basically going into the record, which I think are distorted if not outright false okay okay and and you're gonna um how big a book is this how big a book is this going to be um or do you <laughs> I, I reckon it'll probably end up about fifty thousand words so sort of small paperback novel sized okay well that's a pretty good well that's pretty good is detail. that too big for you pete is that's, that all right? <laughs> it's, it's fine. No, no, it's fine. I'm just trying to get an idea how detailed you're going to go into. So is it coming out in comic book form? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, well, we're, they have those, we're looking for about 250 words, really. Yeah. If you can just kind of <laughs> it up. Can, can I get the kind that's got the hard, like, cardboard pages that, you know, like. <laughs> 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 See a scary and run. No, anyway, anyway, <coughs> anyway. So, um, all right. So fifty thousand. That's pretty good. Um, uh, and are you getting? I I saw you're already getting some flack about that as well. Just for oh, what I tell your side of the story. Obviously, but the, the prompt for me was that. Um, I don't know how up you are in it all, but the the whole thing started originally sort of the uh, Franz Ferdinand moment uh, was when a female game developer called Zoe Quinn was implicated in a sex scandal, which obviously, you know, trolls had a field day with that. Sure. But one of the, one of the things that came out of that was that it turned out she'd been sleeping with various people, including, I believe a couple of different games industry reporters. And it turned out they had had glowing things to say about her in various articles, not reviews, like some people had said, but articles, you know, she'd, she'd basically gotten a profile boost from these people for, for whatever reason. Um, and that connection between them hadn't been disclosed, which, you know, is basic journalistic ethics. If you're fucking someone, or if you're supporting them with money and you shill their product, you should probably tell people that, you know, you have a relationship, whether it's financial or, or personal, whatever. 
Um, so that came out and that's what really caught people's attention. So that started to build up. People started discussing this, wondering what else was going on. Um, further context is that the indie game scene that she was a part of had been kind of holier than now for a few years before that. You know, we're so much better than the than the corrupt mainstream games games people. You know, we're we're much better than everybody else. And it turned out they had feet of clay after all. Um, so all this started to come out and started to to gain steam. And then they started to try and censor it all. And you know, it wasn't allowed on any forums, any discussions, comment sections were closed, all kinds of stuff. And you, you know, you know there's strides and defects. If you try to shut shut people up, they just get more interested and they just kind of right. snowball Ooh, from there. Why are you trying to keep this quiet? <laughs> exactly. And then people started finding out more and more and more, like secret journalism lists and you know, money changing hands and all this kind of horrible stuff going on. And that's that's what made it into a big thing. But then the kind of mainstream media narrative from the very people who were being criticized was that this was a, you know, a harassment campaign, trolling and death threats and all the rest. I don't doubt some of that happened, mostly third party trolls, I suspect. Some of it certainly came the other way. I got, I got threats um, and horrible stuff. Um, I had a mental breakdown during part of it and a, a suicide attempt. And a couple of weeks after that, I was sent razor blades in the post by somebody don't know who trying trying to send some kind of oh, message geez. so you know there was there was shit like that happening on on both sides but only one side of the story is being told so zoe quinn's book is coming out in september i think kind of giving her very biased perspective on what's happened and the wikipedia article is trash it bears no relation to reality whatsoever all the new main newspaper articles and website articles about it are pretty much rubbish, 90, 95% of them. So for me, seeing that happen and knowing that it's not true was just a kind of unbearable situation. So I want to have at least some record from the opposite point of view, from someone who was involved in it, to give my perspective, our perspective on what happened, so that there is at least some kind of counter-narrative out there in the historical record for the future. Because I think it was an important cultural event. People are still sort of name dropping Gamergate whenever internet trolling comes up or you know, crowbarring it into articles about Trump or whatever. And it's just not representative at all of, of what I observed happen. So I wanna at least try to correct the record a bit. So And let's let's be honest. If you are if you are if you are an honest person, if you are a genuine you you genuinely want to get to the facts. And let's say Let's just say you're in Zoe, what's her name? Zoe Quinn, Zoe Quinn's camp, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and you're like, you know, I, I really believe that what she has to say. But if you are, an, if, if you want to be genuine and be honest to yourself, you should read the counterpoint because stories are always he said, she said, and then what's in the middle is somewhere generally, you know, where you find the full truth of everything. Um, so even if, even if, you're completely on one side. You're not on James's side on this. You should definitely check out his book anyway. I mean, to get another perspective and make an educated decision for yourself as to what you believe. I mean, it's it should be that way with everything. You should do that with everything in life. So Yeah. I mean, um, even if you don't agree with what the other side says at all, you should at least try to understand their perspective, why they right. believe what they believe. Yeah, you know, I've tried to do that the other way. It would be nice if people would, would try it in the opposite direction. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm interested. I, I, I'll probably buy it because I um, I don't, you know, I'm still kind of ignorant on it, uh, on the whole gamer. I know it was a big thing and I I just kind of avoid, I generally tend to avoid these kind of things for the most part because it gets my blood pressure up because I start getting pissed off about shit I can't control and I'm not even part of. Uh, so I generally, <laughs> <laughs> generally tend to just avoid the whole fucking, there's nothing to do with me and it's a bit controversial. Good, I'm out. Um, but now I'm getting interested. Uh, so, and, and it's all over. So nobody's still... The, the, if there's fighting, it's just kind of like ricochets there's, and stuff, there's, right? There's stuff still going on. There's some kind of legacy stuff that happened, and there's a lot of people who are still very engaged now in kind of watchdogging for corruption and nepotism and so on. So stuff oh, flares good. up occasionally. Yeah, and there's been some controversy around regionalization of Japanese games because <clears throat> people, when they do localization, aren't just localizing their their prying their own ideology and stuff into the into the translation so there's some ongoing controversies about that and various aspects of game censorship but gaming game itself is pretty much over it's just people keep trying to conflate it with the alt-right or <laughs> you know, other 
stuff uh, beggars belief right right okay fantastic all right well let me give out some links um because it's it's Mother's Day today. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Uh, and and I got to go somewhere with my wife soon, so I got to wrap this up. Uh, so you can find James stuff at Postmortem Studios. That's P O S T M O R T E M S T U D I O S dot WordPress dot com. Uh, you can find him on Facebook, Postmortem Studios. He is on Twitter at Grimachu. That's a Pikachu reference, right? <laughs> Yeah, with the Pikachu. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> he also has a YouTube page. He has some very interesting. I love your your perspectives on your uh, on your YouTube page, uh, and that is uh, post mortem video. Uh, and I'm not going to spell it all out, but if you go to RPG now and you look up post mortem studios, you will find his stuff. It's a big long link with a bunch of numbers and stuff in it. But that link is all <laughs> down there. Um, so go and check out James's stuff uh, and buy it. Gore is looking beautiful. A beautiful set of books Thank you got you. there, um, and uh, I know that I know the hard copies look expensive because you know you getting distribution for such a product as we've already talked about is uh, somewhat problematic, I would imagine. So it's got to be print on demand. So it is what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the shipping that gets you the uh, the the softback cut uh, cover books. Not too bad. So right. should okay. be affordable. But the PDF was very affordable and it's very nice and I like it. So I, I have it. So, so you can always do that and you can play with your iPad at the game table. Uh, that's what most people do nowadays anyway. Uh, all right. So let me, I'm going to run the closer here. James, thanks for coming on. Always yes, a pleasure. thank you very you're much. Always, you're always thank welcome you. back. All right, here we go. Uh, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Unless we record somebody in another country who's on a crazy different timeline. We do it on like a Saturday or something like that. Uh, jump into the chat room and ask our guests questions. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes at YouTube forward slash Mythwits. Uh, find us Mythwits.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and of course Twitch, which I just said. Uh, do like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and reviews. We need it. God damn it. Uh, if you screenshot it or prove it to me somehow that you did a, a review for us on iTunes, I, I might send you something. Uh, I might send you a Tarn Goad. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Mythwits is you part of... You can tie up for an hour yeah, and do all kinds of gore right. stuff to him. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the safe, my safe word is, ow, that fucking hurts. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you like us, you're bound to like other great shows on there. Check out TSRPN.com. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out Stu27.com for more cool stuff to join our mailing list. Hey, if you want to bitch to us about our episode this week, you can always uh, Mythwits at gmail.com. Bring it. I don't give a fuck. Give me what you got. Uh, <laughs> Email Mythwits. Mike Kafis. I <laughs> <laughs> don't have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening or watching or however you consume us. Uh, we're coming to Roku soon. I was just talking to Steve about that. Contracts are in place. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. See you later. <laughs>